Welcome back, everybody, to the second part of my video about Sunset. Now, if you didn't catch the first part, I'll put the link up there, like a little tab, and I'll also put the link down in the description. But I kind of went over why people are playing the main comps that are meta, at least as far as we're aware, on the map right now. So I've dug into some of the basics and talked about where their strengths lie and where you want to be seeing them on the map, talked through some basic defensive setups, some basic attacking setups. But now let's dig into what the pros are doing that's a bit more creative, some of their execs, some of their retakes, that kind of thing. The kind of stuff that makes Maybe you might not be able to pull off in ranked, but maybe you'll be able to pull off if you get into a match or a premier setting or a five stack with your friends or something like that. So let's start out, weirdly enough, with a round towards the very end of the match between Cloud9 and EDG that happened on Sunset. This is round 24, and we're going to look at a B split. I feel like B splits are extremely good right now because teams haven't really developed their protocols about how to defend against them particularly well. So let's just see how this one goes down. We're going to be taking a look. They go for a Cascade Flash into mid here, Cloud9, as they're taking a bit of control up towards mid. They then use the Boom Bot to try and take control as the Harbor Wall starts coming out like this. So they've used that. They've had a snake bite on the other side of things, but for EDG, mostly they've just backed up and appreciated this control of the area. There's a cascade now, which I think is really crucial because when you look at the minimap, most of these players are coming through mid. This is not a B split where they're sending a lot of people through B main, and instead they're sending the majority of them through market here. And what this cascade does here from Jake is that it means that they can funnel in quite an unusual way up towards the back of the site and put pressure on Chishu and segment the map, which is what I talked about a lot in my first video about how the double smokes is going to segment the map and allow you to fight piece by piece for control. At the same time, what you might not have caught is that the dog was putting a lot of pressure this way as the boombot was putting pressure this way. So they've got a bit of a two-pronged approach that's designed to push the EDG players further and further back into the site. When it comes through, you see that the smoke was fairly ineffective. Shishu ended up going down. Nobody's got a dog from the front. Ends up picking off Vanity, but gets traded from B main. And Cloud9 have full site control, something that is quite difficult to get if you only go through B main. But they now control the entirety of the site thanks to that harbor wall and then the Viper wall layered on top of it as well, even though Vanity is actually dead here. But this is an extremely effective hit and something that is... I think a little difficult to pull off in ranked games at the moment because people don't understand the map very well. But if you can kind of direct people as to where they're supposed to throw the utility to make sure you don't get shot back from mid at the beginning and then you take market control and then you're able to split into the site, it's super effective. It's like doing an A split on Ascent. It just ruins a lot of teams' defensive holds because they haven't built proper protocols for it yet. And certainly in ranked, they won't have built proper protocols for it at all. So now let's have a look at an A hit on the other side of the map. And I went through an example that was very similar to this in my previous video, but this is EDG pulling out their Omen entry strategy with Haodong on, uh, in a Chinese game against FPX, so this wasn't from the 10 Global Invitational. But as you can see again here, they have a Prowler trying to help Smoggy get forwards, then a Boombot gets used. We have Snakebite lineups that come through, we have an Orb being thrown here as well. So Viper sends lineups from the back, Boombot is creating this space over here, and just to prep what you're about to see, Haodong, the Omen, who is also the IGL, who's presumably cooked up some of these strategies, is going to TP from about here to here as a Haunt lands up top. So Get ready to appreciate how cool this is when it's all put together. They smoke. The snake bite lands inside the smoke here as well. So if there's anybody defending in the area that Haodong's about to TP into, they would get pushed away. A nade also gets put in there. So potentially someone's getting vulnerable naded. Multiple layers to this strategy. Autumn spams. Autumn gets counter spammed by Smoggy and Haodong. And Lysaur, who thinks he's in a fairly safe situation right now, has a haunt that pops directly above his head. So as Haodong... TP's in with his back to this vulnerable smoke, right? That he knows nobody's inside because of the raise, uh, nade, and the snake bite, and the omen smoke. Haodong now just has the freest kill of his life as Lysaur is lit up by this haunt, and he's able to get that. I'll wind it back for you and not stop pausing it as much so that you can appreciate this as it all happens. But this is a lovely, lovely way of cracking this one open. 
And of course, then the second stage is that we're going to send a paranoia through here. The prowlers are going to come through the alley and we're attempting to put extra player on the other people on the other side of the A side. But all in all, a lovely A exec that allows them to get into A, entry effectively, take site control, find picks in a variety of different ways. And then they're running a 4-1 setup where Kang Kang is supposed to be lurking through mid as well. And this ends up being a 3v1 that's easily cleaned up. So a gorgeous offensive idea by using that fade that a lot of people aren't particularly using at the moment. And in terms of using the fade, take a look at EDG's retake here as well, which I think is also excellent. This is a 4v4 retake, and it's on the pistol round, but this was the best example I could find of it. Obviously, when this gets into rifle rounds, they have even more utility that they can throw into these kind of situations. So if you take a look at the minimap here, this is nobody. He's setting up for a haunt that's going to land it up top here same kind of concept it sees all over the site and is going to be able to catch a ton of people that are playing in good post plant positions and then they're going to use the omen smokes just to lock off this lock off this and try and take site control uh, i thought it was really well executed i think the only thing to improve on this to be honest is that nobody seems pretty far out of the fight i think on a rifle round he's going to be able to use his prowlers though much more effectively send a prowler into this smoke for example to make sure he doesn't get backstabbed as he paths into site and you've got yourself a really nice setup here so you can see on the pistol round, smokes go down, paranoia thrown into Diag, Prowler, Haunt up top, and EDG takes base really nicely. Vanity's completely isolated, manages to get one because of how good of a position Diag is, but completely locked out essentially here, and EDG win the round with a very nice clean retake on A, which I think is something that a lot of teams will not be refined with yet, and certainly I didn't see anybody as good as EDG on the A retakes, or on retake strategies in general, because a lot of B is to do with, like, flooding. Uh, so, let's talk a little bit about the meta on this map, I think. So, when we talk about the meta on the map, often people just think about the compositions, which, again, I went through in my previous video. But I think a another really important, crucial factor about the meta is how fast a map is. Is this a fast-paced map where you can run a lot of... Uh, heavy execs or run a lot of fast hits and that kind of thing are we going to be wanting to slow default on attack side a lot of the time right so if you think about bind bind has either you know explosive execs or it has really slow defaults uh, whereas other maps can trend in different directions split is extremely slow defaulting or extremely fast site pops like that as well and i think that sunset is going to be a similar way Either you're going to run something extremely all-in, or you're going to try and run a bit of a slower round. And this is an example of a slower round and why it works on this map, in my opinion. Because what you're going to see is that the, uh, it, the, the clock has been burnt down. There's only 30 seconds left at this point. And so T1 have just been spending all of this time, over a minute, taking map control in a variety of different ways. But I just want to show you how important map control can be on sunset even compared to other maps right because at this point the defenders have been pushed back away from a so as i was reiterating constantly in my previous video if the defenders lose control of this choke point it becomes way more difficult to hold on so if you hold this choke point you can hold it with just one person like this right if you push that one person away suddenly you need two people one to watch this and one to watch this right or, or wherever they happen to be holding but you still need multiple people there's no one spot that's going to do the trick so these two people are in very passive positions they don't have good information it could still be a slow a hit at 30 seconds left there is nobody really over towards market and the attackers control this angle which makes it quite difficult for the defenders to regain control of mid and on the B side of the map, the defenders have lost control of B main. So now, if you want to peek for B information, you end up facing into the defenders, the def uh, sorry, into the attackers. The attackers are able to post up here. The attackers are able to post up here. The attackers are going to be able to post up on more aggressive angles, like, for example, this one where Carpe is going to get a pick onto Zeppa in just a moment. And you can see how all of this map control makes it really difficult for the defenders to be able to figure out where this site hit is coming through in the final few seconds of the round, which is why it's really crucial that the defenders are active and fighting for map control and re-clearing against something that Cloud9 did very, very well in this tournament. Um, so here's another example of why slow defaulting on this map can really, really work. And it comes back to that idea of cutting the map into small pieces from the double smokes and then using it to generate picks by flushing people out of position so we're going to take a look at this here we have our default viper setup which is going to push back a chamber that's potentially playing in this area oxy uses boom bot so they know that the raise is over there too 
the the boom bot gets broken immediately so oxy knows that there's at least one person over there it's not just the viper utility it's not going to be a fast hit over towards b or a b split or anything like that there is at least a default happening if not a full a exec going on so we look a little further here and one of the other reasons that this viper setup is so good is because you can choose which angle you fight over you see in this instance that zeta has uh, sorry king has dropped the wall but kept the orb up which means that they can fight over the left side and now he can alternate that or not to be honest it depends on what he wants to do but the sky can also throw utility through it so for example they could throw a sky flash through this as king drops the orb to catch somebody behind they could dog through the viper orb they can drop the viper orb and be double facing or on an off angle it makes it very difficult to defend behind this so this not only helps the attackers, my point being, this not only helps the attackers control this area, which is the actual area that they're looking at, but it also applies pressure to this area and this area as well. Because if the Viper Orb or the wall are dropped, suddenly if you're stood in those positions as a defender, you can be getting faced by multiple people and your crosshair placement is going to be appalling. So... That's why this Viper setup is going to be used so often is because it pushes people very far back on A. So you can see now that we have... I'll go to the minimap again. We can see a dog coming through here. King picks up his Viper Orb. So the Viper Orb is now no longer here. King has picked it up and King can now put it down in a different place. But what they're actually going for is a flash to pop around this corner, a snake bite here as well. And this player who could be an omen or a chamber or in this situation a viper as well could have been pushed back from trying to play a position here aggressively has been pushed back by the viper utility then pushed back again by the dog and now is getting pushed around the corner again by the flash and by the snake bite and you can see how this gets capitalized on in just a moment flash comes through snake bite comes through and there's sire player around the other side ready to capitalize so sire players found this pick on the player over there vanity that got flushed out of position now you might say well sire player is so open to jake if he was earlier on this angle but that's where the secondary chamber comes through who is holding the angle for him so carpe is holding this angle for sire player and this nade from oxy is just a little too late they realized what was going on just a fraction too late unfortunately the nade isn't great enough uh, counter utility or rather isn't early enough neither is the uh reckoning and t1 have already managed to default their way into flushing a player out of position and finding a pick so that's a great example i think of why slow defaulting can work really well because you can immediately just reset from this and you can go anywhere else this doesn't have to be part of an a exec this can be just a way that you generate a pick and then fall back and the defenders are going to find it really really difficult to re-clear alley and a main it's going to be almost impossible for them especially if they're down a player so let's move on to some of the important areas to fight over. So we're looking at round three here between Cloud9 and EDG. And EDG have a really nice idea in this round, which is to fake a B split and then push mid for a pick. So at the start of the round, EDG are going to be beginning with their three players in tiles. So this is a 1-3-1 one, one default with the chamber looking over here, the viper setup looking over here, and these three players looking to take mid control and then actually go and look for picks up top in mid in this direction. And Sunset's so unique in that this area of the map is really pushable. Most of the maps, you get to the end of mid and it leads to A or it leads to B. This map it only leads to A if you kind of go through their spawn and back on yourself. It's really a little unusual in that manner. But it creates unique situations like this. So we're going to take a look at the minimap here. Haodong is pushing up tiles to make sure nobody from the defenders is pushing down like this early. And Haodong is getting ready to face this angle. He's not facing it yet until his teammates get there. And now his teammates are in position. A boombot is going to get used like this. And they can also use prowlers. Haodong, once that boombot doesn't take any contact, Haodong can then face on the angle as well. So they're making sure that their smokes player isn't just swinging without any kind of support. The boombot is there to inform whether or not it's safe to do so. And then also this raise fade combo is going to swing at the same time. But remember that this, is, that this is a fake. This is not a genuine play for market control. As soon as the utility is thrown, these guys are immediately going into... a. Um, push towards mid 
And some of the interesting parts about mid, you'll often see a trademark here if the chamber is playing on top of this box, or sometimes you'll see a trademark there if the chamber is playing in this position too, with a rendezvous here, right? But a lot of the time, mid is either going to be empty because teams are early round trying to control the extremities and then returning back to mid, or mid is just going to be controlled by one player, possibly two, but usually just one player. Like Jake is just watching this at the moment. So what that offers is an opportunity for Smoggy and Howdong to, after having faked a bit of market control and made it feel like you're, they're in that area of the map, they then push through their own smoke facing in both directions to wide swing out and see if they can either take a duel or just post up. And what's cool about this is, even though they don't find a pick at the beginning, right? They're just swinging through the smoke, hoping that there's nobody there, to be honest. Now, Jake has heard something and he's worried about this portion of the map, right? And so how do the defenders re-clear this? And I think this is going to be a really big theme of this video that I want you to catch on to really early. How do defenders re-clear on Sunset? Because to me, that's one of the big reasons why defaulting and taking map control and playing double smokes on this map is so good, is because it's actually quite a difficult map to re-clear. And here, the defenders have a job of re-clearing Smoggy and Haodong out from their position. So we'll take a look at the monitor here and see how they do it. So they're posted up on these complementary angles, each watching each other's back. Vanity swings out, almost gets the kill, but Smoggy's posted on the angle and is favored in that kind of spot. Now, it is slightly difficult for Haodong to trade this, so it is more of like a... The advantage for the attackers is just that they're posted up on the angles. The advantage is not necessarily that they're like able to fight together, but they're... they're trying to isolate things down to just a one angle that Smoggy has to focus on, and he's actually posted on the angle, so he has the advantage. Vanity has to swing into him, and so Smoggy should be favored in that position. There's a cascade used. Smoggy ends up being picked off, but as Jake goes, if we pull up the minimap again, as Jake goes to try and reclear mid once more, Haodong is going to be able to, once again, have the advantage in that duel, and despite only having a Guardian, manages to get the pick there. On the other side of things too, if we pull things back to the main monitor, Zeppa actually went for a reclear in market because Zeppa realized that the market pressure was fake, right? As soon as you see two players up here towards spawn, that market pressure must have been a fake. So Zeppa goes to try and reclear the map and ends up getting caught out by nobody who's just posted on this angle. So once uh, this entire round is EDG taking map control and then baiting Cloud9 into going for reclears and punishing them for it. And I think that that's going to be a really effective tool as it is on split to be able to generate picks in a much more slow paced manner on this map. Um, and then having big execs that you can go into if you're still in a 5v5 with, you know, 30 seconds on the clock, something like that. Let's take a look at another attempt to push mid. And this time, it's actually Cloud9 who are pushing mid. And we'll see what they do a little differently. So they have their high tide to block off market and block off top mid at the start. And this feels quite rushed to me. I think this round, what they're attempting to do is go for an A split. So have half their players pathing here and some of their players putting pressure up here. Unfortunately, they've already lost a player down towards A main. So they are in a 4v5 while they're doing this, which is obviously not favorable for them. But what it does mean is that Vanity just has to hold on while these guys go and make the play. So what you'd like to see in this kind of situation, if they're going to try and do things quickly. So if you're going slowly, you're trying to bait the defenders into re-clearing you. But if you're going quickly, you're trying to split into a site. You can't really go slowly and split because there's too many angles to worry about and you need to use utility to block them off. And it's too obvious. You're going to draw too much attention. Uh, and if you're trying to go fast, that doesn't really bait the defenders into re-clearing you because they're just going to hold angles instead. So slow if you want the defenders to re-clear, fast if you want to split into the sites, uh, particularly into A, seems like the more viable option. So what you really want to see here is a cascade to block off here from Jake, and then these guys pathing in this kind of direction, maybe another cascade here, and they're going to be able to get into A and put a lot of pressure on Kang Kang and maybe Smoggy if he commits to the site instead of backing off into spawn. Instead, what we see is something a little sloppy, a little messy here, where they do flash into spawn, but Jake pushes the cascade way deeper than I think he probably should or probably even wants to. It doesn't even block this. It actually misses and goes even further. Um, so that cascade isn't really doing much. That causes Zeppa to have to worry about behind. 
They don't cascade this position either. They double face it, which isn't terrible. Jake manages to get the trade onto Smoggy. But now, Vanity ends up just walking backwards through his wall, which is a bit daft from Vanity. Jake gets another good trade. But unfortunately, because this cascade was bad at the beginning of the round, because the cascade did not land here, now Chishu is going to get an angle over there and drop Zeppo, who has the spike. But you can see what the idea was in this round, and you definitely could execute a strategy like this if the execution was a little cleaner. And I think that's a really cool part about Sunset, is that you can work these weaknesses in the map. You can't just play heavily bunkered into the sights, because if you give up that top passageway through mid, you're going to be in a lot of trouble against any fast clears like that, and you're going to find it really difficult as a defenders to re-clear if they play slowly and quietly. So here's an example of one of those fast pushes I'm talking about, executed well, and this one's a reaction to some B main control. So you can see here that Cloud9 have taken B main control and T1 have an option. Do they want to re-clear B main or do they want to try and react in a different direction? So they go to try and re-clear B main for a moment. You know, there's a bit of a fight that goes on here. They end up getting put into a 4v4 and Zeta makes the call in this spot that instead of committing to these players who are over here, they know that there's two over here in B main still after killing one, right? So they know that there were three players in B main and there's still two now. So instead of making the call to re-clear this area, they are going to try and pivot into an A split. And they're given this option because they're still running a slow default with um, their chamber over towards the A side of the map. And so they go fast up mid, they know that there's not gonna be anybody facing market, and they know that there isn't gonna be anybody really over here because there's so much of a presence over towards B main. So this is a reactive on the fly mid round call, which I think is really a good idea, but not something that you see a huge amount of just yet on sunset. Um, but I think, let's take, yeah, let's take a look at how the execution of this actually happens. So they're going to smoke off market, even though they're pretty sure that there's nobody there. And this second smoke gets popped here, right where I said that the cascade should be from Jake in the previous example that we were talking about. As they come up mid, this is a spot that Whippy likes to play on quite a lot. He's on top of this box with a rendezvous nearby him. Ideally, Whippy's hoping to take a fight down like this, but it's also useful if they come up mid, I suppose. Whippy manages to get one, but he goes one for one in this situation. And T1 are going to keep the tempo up and try and barrel through here before anybody might be able to react from B main and get through one of these smokes here or through here in market. They're going to react through onto Vanity. Vanity's now getting pinched from both sides and Vanity has to leave. And T1 have executed a really nice audible uh, A split that goes through mid. Uh, they've got to worry about people flanking behind, but they do have a trademark there to contain that. And they do have to still worry about the player in front, of course. And they didn't clear out Alley, so there could be somebody in there. But I think that there is a lot of value in having this in your back pocket as a team if you're able to execute stuff like this on the fly. A really nice A split. So let's talk a little bit about defending mid. So this is round seven of Cloud9 versus EDG. And it's C9 using a huge amount of utility to defend mid. Uh, they're going to use this high tide as they do at the beginning of the round a lot of the time. And they have this trademark over here as well. But let's take a look at what happens when EDG decide that they want to contest this. So there's a smoke at the very top of mid from Haodong and a fade haunt being used as well. So at this point, if you pause, both teams are trying to take mid control. The attackers are hoping that this smoke and this haunt are going to be enough for them to just walk through and take a bit of mid control, right? As we've seen from EDG earlier on when I said that they were doing their 131 default. The defenders are hoping that their... Uh, harbor wall which slows you as you go through it and the fact that they are now going to be able to call for this dog that is going to come through like this they're hoping that this utility is going to favor them in mid and they're going to be able to maintain control of it um so you watch what happens here the prowler kind of meets head to head with the dog the dog pushes them back and c9 are going to walk into mid now, C9, I'm sure we're hoping for a slightly earlier timing on being able to get mid control, because this is just as the high tide is going down, which isn't amazing. And Jake's not in a great position to refresh this with a cascade, because it's kind of like sideways on and really awkward here. But they're still going to fight for it. Oxy tucks down. They use a flash. So now they've used dog, flash, high tide, cascade. And Oxy's walking down. And I'm not saying that 
mid pushes like this should be frequent but i think that cloud nine really benefited from the fact that they threw a couple of these in and were using the high tide for conditioning because it made teams teams just couldn't take mid for free they were either scared that they might run into something like this if it was real or if it wasn't so you know if cloud nine were doing something like this okay edg can't just take mid for free but on the rounds where it's just the high tide edg still have to be really diligent and throw the right utility just in case cloud nine are there in this kind of round, you see that they're able to walk down mid. They have Oxy's ult in this spot as well, so it makes it particularly dangerous. And EDG decide to evacuate and leave. As Cloud9 realize that they've left and decide to make the call to try and match the attackers over towards A. One of the other important areas of the map that I think people are going to fight over all the time is the market. I think this market is going to be one of the major areas of contestation on Sunset. And that assumes, of course, that the attackers are able to take mid control. But one of the reasons that market is so good is because it's really difficult to re-clear the defenders, sorry, re-clear the attackers out of that spot. It's very difficult for the defense to hold on and the attackers can just util dump in this spot. We're going to watch a failed attempt at EDG taking market control here, but it's not because of anything that Cloud9 do particularly amazingly. I want to show kind of how EDG are taking market. We already saw in the previous video how Foot, for example, took market control and a little bit of how EDG were going to. But here you can see that the Prowlers and the Boombot are going to inform a paranoia. So the Prowler latches. The paranoia goes through and catches onto the player that the prowler was latched onto. Ideally, then, there is a haunt that goes deeper than this. One of the big problems with this being a failed attempt is that this haunt doesn't go deep enough. Oxy is able to stay on this line, and the trades are not exactly tight together. Haodong is just a little early there, expecting that haunt to have pushed somebody a bit further back. And Oxy and Zeppa, o Oxy actually himself manages to do so well that he buys enough time for Zeppa, the Paranoia, and the Prowler to be kind of dealt with and Zeppa to come back into support. But in general, the market pressure there and the tools that teams are going to have at their disposal favor the attackers in taking market control. Um, and if you take a look at this one, round 20, I just want to showcase again why it's difficult to reclear attackers from this spot. So if we have a look on the minimap, you see that the attackers have managed to get themselves into market. They've got a smoke here, and they've got a smoke here as well. So they are just kind of in a little box in market right now. They've also gone for a bit of a mid-push here, Cloud9, and it failed. But we're not going to focus on that. What we are going to mention, though, is that they are in a 3 versus 5. So they're really at a disadvantage in terms of the numbers situation. But they're in a quite good positional situation right? Their chamber has full B main control, and these two players that are alive have market control as well. So let's take a look at why this is so difficult for EDG. While this smoke exists, which I should mention is from the EDG side, the, 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 this smoke up here is a Viper Orb, right? So this one's been thrown by Cloud9. This one was an omen smoke to try and keep them back from the A hit, from the B split. But while this smoke exists, it's an awkward angle here for Kung Kung and Smoggy to just walk re-clear. It's a long corridor with a bit of a, like a weird thing down by the La Pupuseria or uh, La Pupuseria. I, dude, I don't even know what I'm talking about. It's it, it's certainly not pronounced like that. But anyway, the place where you get Pupuseras. <laughs> So here, Vanity is just able to kind of play with the corner a lot better than Smoggy and Kankan can, can. They have to go for really wide swings to be able to see Vanity, whereas Vanity can just play with the corner a little better here. Vanity manages to get both of them while nobody sneaks in behind and gets Zeppa. And so this goes from being a five, a three versus five to a two v three. Where then nobody gets picked off by Whippy, because if you're trying to reclaim market from the B side, you're going to be open to the B main players a lot of the time too. So it's an awkward situation. It's kind of also difficult to throw good utility down this corridor that you're going to ever be able to scale off. And if you're trying to throw utility for someone here to scale off, then again, they're going to be in this sightline from B main. And take a look at how good this sightline is for somebody in, in B main. They only have to worry about a tiny area. Like this wall just blocks off everybody else on sight. They only have to worry about, you know, the guy that's going to be here or the guy that's going to be on the top platform. That's it. So 
it's it's quite difficult to apply pressure from the defender's side in market. It's difficult to come at it from two angles. It's difficult to throw a good utility there. The choke points are quite small. And talking about choke points being very small, that leads me on to one of the biggest topics of this map, which is defense on B. We've talked quite a bit about retakes on A. I've shown EDG retakes where they have the haunt lineup here, and you know most of their players are coming from this direction. They wall off this, they, they smoke off both of those. They're trying to get in here, then they're putting pressure in alley, that kind of stuff. It's all methodical, it all makes sense. It's all quite a normal retake, to be honest. On B, the normal retakes would be very difficult. You're coming through quite a small choke point here and quite a small choke point here, and there's a big pillar in the middle. But thankfully, the map has been designed with a massive advantage for the defenders on B because this choke point is tiny. It is like a coffin. You are squeezing your way through if you're an attacker trying to get into backside. And then you have a bit of a 50-50 where someone can be at the close left or someone can be behind pillar as well that are really annoying angles to try and clear as you're an attacker getting into backside. And if you decide to go the other way around, if you path like this as an attacker, you have to jump up twice on boxes. You have to jump on a box and then you have to jump on another box. The whole time being inaccurate with your spray, finding it difficult, you are slower to follow up on any utility that you throw. It is awkward for the attackers. And what that means is this is a fantastic map for the defenders to draw a line in the sand right here and say, we are going to maintain control of the back of the site. This is a strategy that you'll sometimes see on maps like Haven. If you look at Haven C, sometimes if people are playing like a cipher composition, they'll pop cages at either side of the default and they'll just play for back site control. Uh, people do it with an omen as well or all sorts of different stuff where their job is to just control the area where the defenders can come back in. And this is called flood defending, or flood rotating, flood retaking, whatever you want to call it, that kind of thing. The idea being that you're holding onto a bit of space in the site, and you're allowing an opening for the rest of your team to flood in and help you. And you're not going to wait for the plant to go down and play a nice set retake where everyone's got their bits in order and everyone throws a piece of utility. You're just prioritizing the speed and the amount of people that you can get into a space to make it difficult for the defender, uh, for the attackers. So let's have a look at how this actually works out in an example here. So this is a 4v4 where EDG are trying to get into B and Jake has thrown a really nice high tide. This one's lovely. It curves around like this. So it's difficult for them to get out through B main, but it's also difficult for them to get once they're into B main, you know, if the attackers get into this spot, it's even more difficult for them to then push Jake in the back of the site. And the harbor is the person that we want to be paying attention to here. EDG do throw a haunt, and they manage to get past the first aspect of the high tide. They clear Zeppa, Jake gets a kill, and throws down a second piece of utility, a cove, which allows him another smoke to maintain back site control. He then swings around the other side, Look at Jake here. He, for a moment, dips inside his cove to make sure that they're not immediately contesting that. And after they don't walk into it for the first, like, one second, it's much less likely that EDG are going to go inside of it then because they're going to assume that Jake could be in there. So then, once Jake is fairly confident that EDG are not going to contest the cove, he walks around the other side looking for good matchups against anybody that might be jumping up the other side of the pillar where he's always going to be favored because the other person's jumping. They're going to be inaccurate. So Jake here is able to hold on to backside fairly effectively as Oxy contests Kang Kang, pushes him back. And even though Jake dies, Oxy is now in position. Whippy is now in position. And Oxy and Whippy can get into backside without being too worried. You know, they don't have to use a lot of utility to clear the close right angle or anything like that. Even though this doesn't look like the textbook perfect flood retake, because Jake ends up dying and Oxy and Whippy are a little further behind, the work that Jake does is perfect for making it much easier for Oxy and Whippy to set up for a good 2v1 here to close out the round. Let's take a look at another example where there's a very clear line in the sand. This is round 18. Um, between Cloud9 and EDG. And it's Cloud9 on, on the attack this time. They're going to throw a high tide, and Oxy's going to go for a showstopper roll. Now, this showstopper roll is always going to be like in a bad situation because you're aiming onto a high ground. It's much harder to land a rocket that's going to be precise. They don't 
have any level of wall that goes over towards uh, market. So that's pretty bad. If this feels on the fly, uh, what they're trying to do is get a high tide that cuts this off, right? You saw them pinging this on the minimap just before the exec came through. Actually, if they had thrown some kind of high tide that went like this, they would have been in a much better position. But because their harbor had already scaled deep, towards B main instead of going back. They just threw it from here and it's a little more awkward. I think in the future, Cloud9 could throw one that went like this and it would achieve their goals a lot more. But even with their goals achieved, even if you think about, you know, Oxy getting a really good exec in here, a good entry, the defenders are still gonna be allowed all of this kind of area. And it, th it really draws a very clear line in the sand. Nobody gets traded out. Smoggy's gonna try and hold on to this back area. And look at Chichu now. Whoa, sorry, my PC's lagging a little bit. Chishu is just able to hold on to this backside area using the attacker's harbor wall to do so. And Zeppa gets caught trying to scale through it as the harbor wall goes down. EDG have backside control. They flooded through Boba with three players and drawn an extremely clear line in the sand that now allows them to try and get into the Viper ult. Vanity makes a bit of a mistake here by throwing the orb, indicating that he's not got his gun out. They take a timing on him. And the trades are good, and EDG are able to get back in and go for a retake. But it's really a flood defense rather than anything set. Let's move on to another example, because I really just want to hammer this home. This is the pistol round, and you might be saying, Well, Josh, why not just try and flash through your own harbor wall in a situation like that? So let's have a look. T1 are going to go for a B-split here, where they put down a Viper wall that kind of segments the map up like this. And they're going to try and push their own Viper wall, so they're not happy with giving Cloud9 control of the back of the site. They want to push this, right? They want to bait Cloud9 in and then push them. The problem is they've... <laughs> I mean, if you look, I'm going to go back five seconds just so you really can appreciate it. The Viper Wall is up. They've sent the flash through. Here's the flash coming from, uh, from B main there. The flash is going to pop through. These guys who are trying to scale take so much longer. If you look on the, the main map, it's King and it's Izu. They just take so long because you have to jump up like multiple times in order to get through. So the spacing is really bad on this hit. They can't follow up on the flash very well. It's to their credit, actually, to be honest, it's not a bad attempt by Zeta in this spot. Uh, sorry, by King in this spot. But Carpe ends up getting caught. These players are like playing naturally counter flash because they're not fully into the site. And some of them are going to be looking both ways. And they manage to collect both of these players as they come through. All in all, just a really awkward fight to try and take because your timings are more difficult because one side has to jump up and it's a really tight choke point on the other side of things as well. So even if you're using utility to try and take it in a two-step approach where you take front sight then back sight control, it's very difficult. And if you think back to my previous video, that's why I was praising the breach alt so much is because it lets you get super deep all at once with the breach alt and the raised double blast packs. I'm going to keep hammering this home to show you another good example of a backside flood, this time from Cloud9. I'm not going to talk over it too much because you already know the idea at this point. T1 are going to take front sight control. There's a cascade in their face from Cloud9. And look at Boba. Cloud9 with a flash, with a nade, with a snake bite are all starting to come through. They're putting pressure on the planters with utility. They're getting into backsight. And yes, they do end up losing this round, but that's because it's an eco for Cloud9. If they had rifles, they are winning this. You can see here as well that this this is my final example of why holding onto backside control is so important on B. And this is T1 with a nice example of how to use an omen smoke to help you. So Zeta's under quite a bit of pressure here. This is the pistol round. And Zeta's getting pressured. There's a, a lot of market control coming through here by Cloud9. This omen smoke comes through, right? And this one you might think is a bit weird because it actually cuts off Zeta's sight line. This snake bite has been thrown through here. Zeta should want to fight the market entrance, shouldn't he? After all, we saw EDG smoke like this previously and try and fight here. But instead, what T1 go for is a smoke that lands right here on... I actually think it lands um, on the... Uh, there's like a... This is the top box, right? And then there's a smaller box like underneath here. And I think, I might be wrong, but I think it lands on this smaller box because it sits quite deep down on the floor. And you'll see as this smoke blooms, what it allows them to do. 
So as the attackers come in on their B split, they're just trying to hold on to backside control. And look at how weird this is for Oxy. This smoke is not a full-size smoke, right? Where it would bloom up like this, where Oxy can properly play inside of it and has a ton of room and can swing out of it in multiple directions. Anywhere that Oxy swings from, these defenders are going to be able to see him super early on. And not just that, if Oxy doesn't play inside the smoke, it actually allows the defenders to hop into this smoke and apply pressure to front sight. So this helps the defenders have some way of transitioning from back sight control to front sight control. And you can see here, Oxy ends up getting punished trying to go for a swing through the smoke where he's not really favored. It's a weird smoke to try and do that out of. Zeta then drops into the smoke to go from back sight to front sight, swings through it, and can swing through it in multiple ways, could swing through it at the front, could swing through it at its apex, could swing through it from behind, as he actually intends to do. And Zeta then is going to be able to pick up Vanity. So I thought this was a really cool idea, again, that builds on the idea that you want to be holding on to back B control, but there's multiple different options for trying to push into front sight. One of the other things that I want to talk about here in terms of key areas of the map to fight over is following on from what we were discussing in mid. So I said that this high tide was giving Cloud9 a lot of prio in mid. It makes the attackers scared that they could be doing something aggressive on the defense. And here we're going to look at a double operator setup that Cloud9 went for. One in a very standard position over towards A, which gets value, as it's often going to do if you don't use a Prowler. Um, and the other, more interestingly, I think, is Oxy walking through here to pick towards tiles. And I think this demonstrates that as the attackers, tiles control is really important, but also you don't really want to get a player stuck in this spot if you're going for a sight hit somewhere else. Like, a lot of the time you don't really want to push somebody deep into tiles all alone, especially if it's Haodong with the spike, right? But if you don't, you can fall into situations like this where an operator gets a kill over towards A, and because Cloud9 have been conditioning mid-aggression, 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 even though they don't do it that often, they're still conditioning it, um, EDG have been playing passive in mid, and it allows Oxy to get onto this line, he hits a glorious flick, and picks off Haodong. So Tiles Prio, again, being something that follows on from that mid-control. Um... The, the other uh, example that I wanted to show you around tiles control comes from the foot focus game, so a different composition. And this one is going to be looking at how foot are playing in mid. So they're actually playing four players in mid on this round to try and hammer home the fact that focus cannot take mid control. And what you'll notice as a real theme here is that most of the time the defenders are pushing when they have showstopper up or about to be up. And in this round, CNED gets a kill and gets the showstopper online. But showstopper is extremely good if your raise is gonna make a push down mid. So there's an aftershock early here, which allows the attacker, sorry, allows the defenders who are pushing to take tiles prior. Lime gets pushed back and the wall really cements this. So there is now a wall here that the Sage can be on top of and swing to fight this. But it also means that you don't need to be worried about getting pushed from behind. So these defenders can now fully focus on just walking down mid. The tournament thus far beating Heretics, uh... They go for the walk down mid with one person watching right, one person watching left. CNED gets a kill. He gets his showstopper online, immediately pops it. Crax swings on the sage wall. Crax gets traded. CNED trades with the showstopper. And they're now in a 4v2 situation where the focus players have no map control at all. They weren't fast enough to be able to pivot into, you know, a quick A hit or something. They tried to fight mid and they got absolutely smoked as a result of it. I also want to end this video just by talking about some cool angles that you can play on on this map that are either funky or are going to give people an advantage or maybe something that you can pull into your ranked games. Because I understand that a lot of this video is not really applicable to your day-to-day -day experience of Sunset. It's going to be more about appreciating the, the stuff that happens in the pro game. So here's some really cool angles that I think should be prioritized on Sunset. One of them is this Diag anchoring spot. In this situation, Kang Kang is getting pushed back with all of this utility, a Phoenix Flash and a Breach Flash. And what you'll see on the minimap is as he leaves... He, he teleports back to here. As he leaves, Haodong play, plays in. So the, the footsteps kind of play Haodong quietly back into Diag to anchor. 
And he's the person that I want to really focus on. Because with somebody anchoring in this spot, they can set up crossfires like this, and they can also set up crossfires like this. And the nature of this Diag anchor spot means that you can isolate the 1v1s really, really well. So as this sight hit comes through, Haodong smokes off one aspect of it, dodges the aftershock, throws out a paranoia. Look at his positioning right now, okay? Because I've seen a lot of people play Diag incorrectly where they tuck themselves all the way back in the corner. Haodong is moving forwards, and this box here that I'm highlighting is is meaning that he is not having to worry about getting shot in the back from Ali. If you were a player from FPX right now who was pushing up Ali, you would not be able to see Haodong. But Haodong can focus forwards on making this crossfire happen. And then if he wants to later, he can walk the other way around and he can set up a crossfire with Kang Kang, the opposite direction, which we may just see in a moment. So look, as he comes here, he now comes forward the other direction. He now cannot be seen from A main, but he can now set up a crossfire with Kang Kang over towards anybody that might be coming towards Ali. So trying to find these opportunities, you shouldn't try to start the round anchoring at Diag. But if you get pushed back, if you're, you know, if you're a chamber and you get pushed back, or if you're a, a, an omen and you get pushed back, trying to play from this position and set up your teammates in very natural spots at spawn and at uh, this kind of connector as well, the A mid connector, you've just got such natural, fantastic positions to play. And you'll see in this round, Howdon doesn't even really do that much. He's just bait. He just kind of sits there. And as FPX tried to deal with him, Smoggy and Kang Kang and nobody end up being the people that actually do the work. Howdong is just minimizing the fights that he has to take and getting FPX caught in a meat grinder. And Howdong doesn't even take a point of damage at the end of all of this because they never even reached him. They got caught by the crossfires beforehand. And I'm going to show you, because that position is so powerful, there are very specific ways that you need to deal with that. And it means that if you think about it, right, if you've got a spot where you can hop to one side and you're clear from the people behind you and then hop to the other side and clear from the people that way it means that it's hard to get a perfect pincer timing on them because they'll just push forwards isolate one and then push backwards and isolate the other and so what you need to do a lot of the time is double push from the same direction which might seem a bit counterintuitive because you know if you want to try to pinch somebody or like flush someone out of a position normally you don't want to go all the way around you'll end up playing ring of rosie with them but in this spot it's much better to do so so if you take a look at what's going on in this round first of all we've got a really cool viper's pit that vanity's put down cloud nine have put this one that goes all the way like this which is really sick um but that's not what i really want to draw focus to again i want to focus on the diag anchor spot which this time is being played by jake so as the retake comes through, we see again this excellent retake from EDG where the haunt goes up really high. These players are coming back through and they throw a raise nade back here into, we'll just go back so that you can see that again. So there's a raise nade that gets thrown into this back diag area, which pushes Jake out for a moment. Jake then has to break the haunt, but now Jake gets back into position. Kankan -Kan goes for a bit of a silly play but i think he believes he's covered by the <laughs> by the cascade howdon gets the trade on it though the seize is used onto jake's position which catches onto him so they've not only used the the paint shells but now they've used the seize as well on top of that later on and they're going to double clear this together so they don't try to split up. Can you imagine what would have happened in this situation if nobody had gone around this side? First of all, he might have had to deal with Zeppa. But even if he had been able to fight Jake, Jake would have been able to take the fight here first against Smoggy and then would have been able to turn around and deal with nobody. It would have been very hard to get perfect timings on this. But because they go together, because Smoggy wide swings and then nobody tucks in for a, a shallower swing a, a few seconds, well, you know, like half a second later, they, they get a really effective trade. And in fact, actually, they don't even need the trade. But they get a really effective kill there onto Jake. There was even a snake bite coming through at the end there as well. Really putting a lot of emphasis on clearing Jake out of that position in a very diligent, good way. If you just run in there one by one, you will get killed by a player anchoring in that spot. You've got to be cautious about it. Um, I'd also like to talk about some of the other spots that I think are really just kooky on this map. So 
This is um, this is round fifteen. I'm gonna go back a little bit. Actually, I've started this one a little too uh, too late. So we talked about this one in my previous video when we were discussing the power of harbor on this map. This is a this is a replay. All right. So here's here's the power of the harbor. Obviously, it stops Kang Kang from getting this sight line, but. If he was playing against an omen, this is a really fun spot to play on. This is on top of a box over in like the A mid connector. You can play with your trademark here in front. You can play with a rendezvous down in this corner or a rendezvous kind of behind you over towards the, the right. Um, on the minimap, that would look something more like uh, putting your rendezvous here or putting your rendezvous like back here, something like that. And there are multiple high ground positions here where you can see over the top of omen smokes. Now, Kang Kang's not going to be able to find too much value here. He even gets snake bited off. But you also see Hao Dong on top of another box. Hao Dong as Omen has got on top of another one of these boxes here. And that means that if they have an Omen smoke over towards the A spawn, he's going to be able to see over the top of that into Ali as well. And in fact, he can even see over the top of a harbor wall here because he's that high up. He's that elevated. They go for a cascade to make sure that he really can't see at that point. And Haodong's going to get back onto this spot, seeing if he can get any kind of extra value. Especially once the cascade falls. You can see even with the size of the Viper Orb, Haodong still has angles over the top of this. Um, and I just wanted to demonstrate by hopping into the game here. Um, let's see if it'll capture the game for me. There we go. What these spots actually look like once they have... Uh, omen smokes on them. So I am an omen in this spot, but you could play this spot as a chamber. You can put your rendezvous yeah. here, you can put your rendezvous yeah. here, you can put your rendezvous yeah. here as well. And what it looks like if, you know, if the opponents omen smoke this off, you're going to be able to get angles look over the top of this. I mean, you can basically see everything from this position. Another good spot that we saw Haodong playing on uh, is over here, right? If they omen smoke this kind of position, I'll actually omen smoke here first. So this was one that a lot of people were doing, right? To be able to get in, you can definitely see over the top of this. And it has a crack all the way down the side as well. And if they omen smoke here, you can again see over the top of this. You can basically see everything. You could shoot them in the toes if you wanted to as they were coming out through alley. So you have massive advantages over people if you're using this kind of high ground spot, which is another reason why I think teams are going to try and use omen instead of harbor because... It, it's valuable to play against it as well. Another spot that we saw attackers using a lot of the time is that they would try and get their chamber or their rays up on top of this. And this is a good spot because while it looks like it's out in the open, you can actually jump up or um, TP up to here with the rendezvous before you can be seen. So you don't have to TP all the way up in the middle and be exposed to this angle. You can smoke that off or try and jump up and hug this corner so that you can't be seen. And then you swing as somebody swings on the down as well. And you have a high low position where you can def destroy anybody that's playing, you know, up there or there or there. Any of these kind of spots. You can't properly swing around into sight. You'll end up falling off. But it is fairly good for being able to swing with somebody down like this. Um... One of the other spots that I wanted to show you on A is a post-plant position, again, that the attackers are going to use, which is in this corner. This isn't being used a huge amount by pro teams, but I think it will be. Because if you're playing post-plant spots on site, this is a really nice position to be able to hold an angle here with somebody and then immediately rotate over and swing as someone takes contact. So let's say you have somebody taking contact there or somebody taking contact here or someone taking contact over there. As soon as they take the contact, you swing like this. It's going to create high-low setups with somebody peeking from this angle. You know, you, you can be on top of this box. You can wide swing as much as you like. It, it's just an extremely effective position of play that you can play high-low with somebody in this kind of spot. Tons and tons of different options. Let's go over to the B side of the map, though, a little bit and explain some other positions um, of which I think the most common that I think everybody is going to know at this point, but bears reiterating, is this kind of area. So if an omen is going to smoke in a really standard kind of omen smoke spot like this, you're going to be able to get up and see over the top into some sight lines there. I mean, a lot of the time the omens actually, sorry, are going to end up smoking like this, of course. Cover going out. Right? My bad. I was thinking about it from the defender's point of view, but the attackers are going to be omen smoking like this, sorry, because they want the smoke to look good from their perspective, right? They want the smoke to not allow too many options for you to walk through it. But what that does is it allows you options to look over the top here 
and over the top here as well. So if you're smoking here, it can be a lot better to smoke it a little bit further over to the left, something like this. So if you're a defender, that's still quite a nice smoke for you, but... Uh, sorry, if you're an attacker, that's still quite a nice smoke for you, but it doesn't allow the defender's options over the top of Boba to be able to see properly. Um, and I think... Those kind of little spots, along with, cover you know, this smoke that we were already talking about before as well, are just weird ways that you can try and create advantages for yourself while you're playing this map as an omen or a chamber or something like that. So, there's a lot of cool stuff that you can do. You can, of course, I mean, the last thing that I should probably just quickly take a look at is the, the other spot that you can try to play on is here. Obviously, if somebody omen smokes over towards um, market, and this is would be the attacker's omen smoke. You can see over the top of this. The problem with this, it probably will work in your ranked games, but in any kind of pro play, you're essentially just creating the world's worst one-way smoke because you're your um or one-way position i suppose because your legs can always be seen from this spot from anybody over here so if they just throw the most simple of smokes over towards mid you're gonna get shot by the lurker the backstabber the bee splitter anything a lot of the time so it might work in your rank games but it's, you're not gonna see it too much time in the, in the pro play but yeah maybe another thing to just throw in all in all, though, those are some things that I've learned from just watching Sunset uh, being played in the 10 Invitational and the Red Bull EMEA home ground. Uh, I hope you liked it. I'm interested to see where this map goes and whether people go for Omen or whether they go for Harbor or other various different situations, whether Foot's idea of running the Breach and the Sage is going to end up being useful on this map or whether people will default back to more normal compositions like the Breach Sova that we see on so many different maps. I feel like there are tons of different ideas that you could potentially go for here but i really like the ones that i've gone through where it's more lotus-esque with the double smokes the chamber the rays and the fade or the sky i think that seems like a very good meta archetype to try and build out from anyway i hope you learned something and give me a subscribe if you have or you want to watch any more valorant analysis content and for now i'll see you in my next video